thank you for joining to uh, another lecture. Um, so last time, you'll remember, we talked about transformations. Uh, today, we're going to continue uh, our discussion of transformations. And we're going to continue with 3D affine transformations. Uh, and, and then we're going to go into viewing and all that stuff. 3D is not going to be too hard, actually. So 3D is going to be just a, a extension of what we covered in 2D. So when we think about affine transformations, we said that we can represent them using a matrix, actually specifically a 3 by 3 matrix in 2D, using homogeneous coordinates. In 3D, we're going to have a 4 by 4 matrix instead of a um, because in 3D we're using homogeneous coordinates, that means we have an extra extra coordinate uh, so that we can do the trick that we did with, with translation. Uh, so in 3D we're going to get a 4 by 4 matrix. Uh, the first three are going to be x, and y, and z coordinates, and uh, the last one is going to be what we what we typically call it as the the w coordinate. Right? It's the the additional coordinate, the fourth coordinate. All right. And if you look at these matrices, I'm writing the bottom part as 0, 0, 0, 1, right? So, and this one was 0, 0, 1. So we're not changing the last row. All right. Now, now let's see what our transformations will look like. Um, and I'm going to start with the, the simplest one, scale. Simplest one is scale. So it's, it's like an identity matrix multiplied by some value. So this was our scale matrix in 2D. And our scale matrix in 3D is going to be very similar. We just have a third row, right? Translation. Again, very simple. Remember, we're putting the translation values over here. In 3D, we're putting the translation values right here. It's the same thing. It's just X, Y, Z instead of just being X, Y. Very, very simple, right? OK. So rotation. Now, in, in 2D, when I have a, an, an object, um, I can rotate it like like clockwise like this, or I can rotate it as um, I can rotate it counterclockwise, right? But nonetheless, the rotation is always happening in in this plane, right? So if you look at the axis of rotation, the axis of rotation is always the same. Yeah, I'm moving it right or left, clockwise or counterclockwise, but I always rotate it around the same axis in 2D because I don't have an, another axis to rotate anything around. But when we go to 3D, things are going to be a little bit different. In 3D, I, have, I can rotate things in various ways. So I can rotate this object around the, the x-axis, in which case it will look like this. I can rotate it around the y-axis, I can, or I can rotate it around the z-axis, right? These are very, very different rotations. And we kind of need to figure out a way to cover all three of them. Actually, we can take an object and rotate it er around any given vector in any random axis. It doesn't have to be just one axis. So I'm pretty sure when you look at these three, um, it, you, you can tell that they're rotation around x, rotation around y, rotation around z. This one is a little tricky to see but it's actually rotation around this, this vector that I'm showing here. And if you don't believe me, let me rotate it around uh, so you can see, if you look directly from, from that axis, uh, you can see it's, it's rotating around it. All right, now that I hope you believe me, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna tell you something interesting, actually. Uh, so rotation around this, this any axis concept might sound sort of, complicated and scary, and it might be, but the nice thing about it is I can represent rotation around any given axis as a combination of rotations around x, y, and z axes. So given any vector and the rotation around that vector can be decomposed into three rotations, one around x, one around y, and then one around z. Now, I'm not telling you exactly how to do this. Um, it, it, that, that part is a little mathy. It's actually possible. Uh, someone gives you an, an axis and a, a, and a rotation angle. You can actually construct the matrix, um, and you can construct the. You can get the rotations around x, y, and z. But it's it's a, it's a little mathy. So I'm um, I'm going to show you how how it how it all comes together. 
but I'm not going to tell you how to decompose it in three pieces. Nonetheless, it's important, I think, for you all to understand that this is possible, right? Given a rotation around any random axis, I can decompose it into uh, these three rotations. All right, let's take a look at what these three rotations look like. So these are going to be our fundamental functions for rotation in 3D. Uh, so now, now look at this one, rotation around z-axis. So this is the one that looks very much like what we had before, right? It's the same matrix, except that I have this additional column here and I have this additional row. Uh, except for that, it is, it, is going to be, uh, it is going to be the same thing, right? And, and this is not surprising because, you know, the rotation axis is still the same axis. We were rotating around the sort of uh, an axis that was perturbing out of the 2D plane. And we're sort of doing something very similar, right? The rotation is uh, around the Z axis that's outside of the X, Y plane. And that's why this matrix looks very much like the other one. Uh, and these other two look very similar too. Uh, so whichever axis I'm rotating around, that axis remains unchanged. So if you look at over here, the, the one that is probably the most familiar to us, you see that the Z value, uh, because this, this row is zero, zero, one, zero, it means the Z, this, this matrix does not change the Z value, which makes sense because I'm rotating around the Z axis and only X and Y values are supposed to change, right? And the Z values are not supposed to change by rotation around Z axis. And the same applies to rotation around Y axis. If I'm rotating around Y axis, the Y values are not supposed to change. If I'm rotating around X axis, the X values are not supposed to change. Right, so that's that's why those rows are very simple, like just a, co a copy from the uh, identity matrix, and the others are just rotations from you know the, the components of the rotation matrix. Very simple stuff, right? The only com complication here is the fact that we have three different rotation bases instead of just having one. Um, so if you look at what a, a rotation around a, an arbitrary axis would look like. Uh, so this, this uh, resulting um, formulation here is a little bit complicated, right? So if you can decompose this into rotations around first X and then Y and then Z, right? In this order. I'm going to keep repeating this because this is, this is very, very important. Uh, I first apply X and then Y and then Z. So I first multiply by this matrix and then the next one and then the next one, right? Uh, so when I do rotation in this form, I get the, this formula. So if I want to do, uh, if I, if I know how to decompose my rotation around the given axis into three rotations, I can write this matrix like this. Uh, again, you know, I just wanted to show you that this, this kind of looks a little complicated. If you actually write it as an equation that, that directly comes from the direction of the axis and the rotation angle becomes it looks a bit more complicated. Uh, but conceptually, these are very simple things. Uh, so I don't necessarily need you to memorize these formulas or anything. That, that's why I'm not going into the details of it. But suffice it to know, I think, for you uh, that this, this exists. You, you can do this. <laughs> All right? uh, and you can easily look up the formula if, you're, if you ever need it. Uh, so, let me continue talking about rotation matrices a little bit more. Uh, so, as I said, we're, we're drawing rotation around, uh, around a particular, in, in a particular order. So in this case, I'm rotating around X, and then Y, and then Z, right? Uh, so um, this is not the same thing as do it, doing rotations with the same angles around the same axis in a different order. So if I first rotate around X and then Z and then Y, I'm going to get a very different rotation, even though I'm using the same angles for each axis, right? So this, it's, these two are not the same, and of course, it's not the same as this, these are not the same as this, these are not the same as this, these are not the same as this. So I, I have six different versions that the, the, uh, the way that I can uh, combine them together and they are going to be different. Now, given a, a rotation around any axis, so around any, any arbitrary axis, 
I can decompose it into any one of these, right? But I, the, the, the rotation angles that I'm going to get are going to be different for them to represent the same rotation. Right? If you're using the same rotation values for each axis, then they're not going to be, they're not going to be the same. And remember, again, repeating, multiplication order, right? We first apply this one, and then this one, and then this one. Now, this is going to come up, and a lot of you are going to make mistakes on this. That's why I'm repeating it again. You know, the, the matrix on the right is the first transformation that is applied. And then next one, and then next one, in this order. Okay? Well, hopefully, uh, fewer of you will make that mistake now, so we're good. <laughs> Okay, the last thing we're going to do about transformations is going to be about viewing. So here's what I mean. Uh, in 3D, I have an object, some object, whatever. And what I would like to do is to create an image of that object, right? So um, that's the rendering process. Uh, the output of rendering is going to be, is going to be this, some, some image from some, some view angle that I'm, I'm looking at this object. Now, you can think about this as like I'm, I'm looking at this, this object through some, 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 some display, right? And I'm, I'm seeing it, and this is the image that I see when I look at it, and that's going to appear on my screen. And whatever's behind the screen is just a <laughs> virtual environment, all right? Uh, so uh, the way to think about this is now I'm talking about this in simpler terms, things are going to get a bit more complicated than later on. Uh, so imagine that there is a, a virtual environment behind this display. And that's what I'm going to be seeing on my display. Like I, I have something, some uh, character, some scene, whatever. And it, can, it can be animating, of course. But animation, we're going to get there. We don't, we don't care about animation just yet. Just, just, just freeze this guy. All right, stop. Uh, so, um, what I would like to do is that I would like to know what it will look like on this display, right? I have this, this 3D object and what it will look like on this display. That's going to be the rendering operation. And at the end of it, I'm going to get a raster image that represents this. And the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to take this, this, this object, the entire scene, and I'm going to project it towards my screen. Now you can think about it that way. I'm, going to, I'm just going to flatten it. So when I do that, I'm going to get an image that looks something like this. All right. So that's the that's the the, the main idea. So I'm just collapsing the the scene so that I'm going to be getting an an, an image an image a representation of this. Now th these are these are all conceptual. It doesn't. Mathematically, that's not exactly what we're doing. We're still keeping the, the third dimension uh, alive. We're not destroying it completely. But conceptually, that's, that's what we're, we're trying to do. Right? Um, so to be able to do this, what we need to do is to define a coordinate frame that will represent this environment. Right? So if I can transform my, my scene into, into this coordinate frame uh, that represents this, this view volume uh, that contains my scene, then I can just collapse it in, in, in this direction somehow and uh, get my final image. Right? That's, that's what I'm going to be using it for. So um, let's define a coordinate frame. OK, um, what's the most sensible place for placing um, my origin. I'm going to say that the center of my display, right? It's, a, it's just a sensible location, right? So center of my display, that's where I'm going to have my origin. Okay. Um, so what's the, where, where should my X coordinate be? I mean, I'm looking at this, right? So X coordinate should probably be this way, right? From left to right. That kind of makes sense. So, all right, this is going to be my X coordinate. And probably my Y coordinate should be up then. So it's like a, when I look at a 2D, when I look at a 2D image, 
its x coordinate will be this way and its y coordinate will be this way and it's like I'm looking at a 2D image. Does, does that make sense? Now when we're looking at raster images oftentimes we pick the y coordinate as like the opposite going this way because we like to start from uh, the, the top left corner. Um, so y coordinate sometimes um, is flipped but you know this, this is a more natural thing to do like x is left and y is out when we're drawing a graph on on the screen that's what we would like to see so if this is x and this is y using right-handed coordinate system my z coordinate is defined for me now my z coordinate has to be this one right so the funny thing is that in, in this form my entire scene will have negative z values because my origin is here everything behind my screen is going to have negative z values and moving away from my view means going into more and more negative values okay i mean this this you, you see where this is coming from right so this is coming from how i pick x and y coordinates because i want this to be analogous to dealing with 2d images or anything 2d graphics basically uh, so the z coordinate sort of is automatically defined for me okay so this is my this is my coordinate frame uh, and uh, and i'm going to call this and i'm going to call this this coordinate frame my um, my camera space or view space so when I refer to camera space or view space, I'm talking about a, a coordinate frame very much like this. So when I when I look at it, x is this way, y is up, and z is sort of going pointing behind me. Uh, and the nice thing here is uh, is that now I can collapse my scene in the z direction, and that's going to give me the image that I want. Right, and the part of the scene that I can see over here, the, the, the virtual stuff that I can see, is going to be contained in a volume, and I'll, I'll call it the, the view volume. Right? The view volume represents the, the part, part of the scene that I, I'm, I can see now. Now, there might be things behind me in a virtual world or some, someplace else. I won't be seeing them. I'm only going to be seeing the part of a scene that is contained inside this view volume. Right? I'm not going to see anything else. All good. Uh, so let's see how we get there and how we use this concept. Uh, we're going to start with viewing transformations. Uh, so I, we talked about this briefly last time. When I'm building a scene, I'm going to be building it out of you know, multiple models. In this case, I have a chair model and I have a table model. And these models are de defined in their own model space or object space. So they're just designed in some space where they have a coordinate frame representation to, to, uh, to identify what all of, any of these make, uh, vectors representing this model mean. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to take these objects and I'm going to transform them into certain positions and uh, orientations or rotations. Uh, so I'm going to apply rotations, uh, translations and scale, basically alpine transformations, to move them into where they're supposed to go in the scene that I'm building. So I'm going to have a, a scene space or a world space um, that is going to contain these, these objects uh, with a different uh, containing a different uh, coordinate frame. Right. So how do you do this? If you ask, well, you do this by applying <laughs> a model transformation. And that's going to be just multiplied by a transformation matrix. Now, how do I decide what that transformation matrix is supposed to be? Well, it's, I don't know, you're designing your scene. <laughs> you're, you're picking these objects and putting them somewhere. So, you know, wherever you're putting them, you need to use the, 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 the corresponding transformation matrix that represents that, uh, uh, that transformation. So there's no one answer to this. Like you, you can, this is like a custom process. I'm, I'm designing this scene and, and this is the way that I'm designing the scene. 
So there, you know, uh, when you're using um, any off-the-shelf software that will allow you to take an object and move it around and rotate it and scale it, uh, and when you do that, the the software uh, is going to compute the the transformation matrix uh, under the hood, and and then go, and then it's going to apply that transformation matrix to to form this this C, right? But of course, it could be just showing you the rotation translation and scale. So now this is the part that's sort of related to the, uh, the our next project, project two. Uh, we're going to be doing something very much like this, but we're going to be doing this in 2D, right? We're going to be given translation, rotation, and scale values, and we're going to be forming our scene with those values. So that was one part of the project. All right, so this is my, this is my scene now. Uh, next, let's uh, go towards view and transformation. Now, if I want to have view and transformation, I want to sort of um, take this world space or scene space and convert it into, convert it into a space that is going to be uh, similar to the view space that I talked about a few slides ago. So I'm going to figure out a, um, a I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to define where I'm going to be observing this scene from. Right? So one way to do that is just to put a camera in the scene. There it is. This is my camera. So with this camera, I'm oriented this way. I'm going to have some view transformation that will take all of these vectors into this uh, camera space or view space. All right. Now, uh, as you can see, this, this Z coordinate here is pointing towards behind the camera. So camera will be looking at, looking towards its negative Z direction, its local negative Z direction. I'm calling it local negative Z direction because negative Z direction in this space is different than negative Z direction in this space. I'm talking about the camera space negative Z direction. Y represents the up vector, as we call it, uh, and X is you know, representing the, the side direction. So um, I'm going to have to, like, to be able to define this transformation, I am going to need to uh, figure out where my camera is positioned. So like the, the position of the camera, that will define its translation. And I'll need to figure out how it's oriented, how it's rotated. Uh, so typically, um, we can, we can do this by just moving the camera and rotating. Um, uh, scale, probably I shouldn't apply because, you know, why would I scale my camera? Uh, but, you know, translation and rotation can be directly used, translation and rotation matrices, for placing a camera. But what we typically use for defining this transformation is, the, um, is, is just a little bit different. The way that we would typically use uh, the, uh, define this this transform transformation is that we're going to define the position, and then we're going to define in which direction the camera is looking at. That's going to be my negative z direction, and which what is my up vector, and if I know which direction the camera is looking at and what is my up vector, I can actually get the uh, camera's x, uh, x, y, and z coordinates in world space and if I know those vectors in world space I can easily construct the transformation matrix uh, that will uh, that will basically give me uh, that transformation to that space okay. so that's typically how we construct it uh, but for the time being that part is is not too important so I'm not going to get into the details of this, but you can also construct it by applying transformation, rotation, and scale, and, and so forth. All right, so this is what we did. We built our scene, and then we transformed everything to a to, to camera space, Now, um, or the view space. Now, in the view space, if I'm, it, my scene now looks something like this, right? This was, this was where my camera was, right? <laughs> so it's like I'm, I'm looking through here. So this is what my scene looks like in this uh, camera or view space. So my view volume contains, you know, a part of these, these objects, maybe, maybe all of them, maybe, maybe a part of them. 
So I'm just going to be uh, projecting these. I'm just going to be projecting these to the screen to, to see them, right? So uh, the question is, um, how do I, how am I going to define this, this view volume? I mean, I, I know how to define the, the camera coordinates. We, we talked about this, right? So I know how to transform vectors into this space, but this, this view volume has to be defined as well. So the way that I'm going to define this view volume is, of course, like the, the one end of my monitor is going to be, uh, or bottom of end of my screen, is going to be the minimum x coordinates. Let's call it the, the left side L, All right? So this is, there it is, that's the left side. And the right side is going to be R. So uh, x values going from L to R are going to be within my view volume. I can do the same thing for y, uh, y values going from this b representing bottom uh, to t representing top are going to be uh, within the view volume. Uh, I can do the same thing in, in z. So uh, what I'm going to have here is that uh, at the very end, I'm going to have a far plane. So I'm not going to be seeing things all the way to infinity. I'm going to be seeing things up to a certain distance. Uh, and that's going to be defined by the far plane, so let's call it F. I can actually do the same thing for uh, for the, the the closest Z uh, Z values. So I can also define a near plane, and I'm actually I'm going to have to define a near plane. It doesn't have to be zero. I can just put it wherever I want. Actually, in most cases, it's not going to be zero, uh, but doesn't matter for the time being. So I'm I'm just picking a value uh, for that. So I have near value and a far value for the z-axis as well. Now this is my view volume. Um, but what we typically use um, when we're doing uh, rendering related uh, operations, projection operations, is that I would like to take this view volume to uh, and convert it to something uh, that's more standardized. So I would like to convert this to something that looks more like a unit cube. It's not quite a unit cube. Uh, it's actually larger than a unit cube. It's, it's what we call this, this canonical view volume. And the canonical view volume, uh, I'm going to have the, the limits of my view uh, will be defined such that all, in all three axes, um, the, the, the valid values inside this volume will be uh, from minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 to 1 in x, minus 1 to 1 in, in y, and minus 1 to 1 in z. All right. And so the center of my v volume, by definition, uh, canonical v volume, is going to be the center of this cube. All right. So it's, it's a 2 by 2 by 2 cube. Um, that's the, the canonical v volume that we use uh, for, for representing everything. So at the, at the end, at the end, what I would like to do is that I would like to get, I would like to take my camera space positions and convert them into uh, a canonical view volume, and that's what we're going to be calling uh, projection transformation. Right. So projection is the process of taking this camera space and convert it into the, this canonical view volume. Um, now the the, the interesting thing here is that, so if, if this is the z-axis, the image is going to be formed on, on, this side of the, on this side of the canonical view volume, right? Okay, the image is going to be sort of uh, squished into a, a square. Uh, so I can you know, non-uniformly scale it to the, to the correct shape so I can see it properly. Uh, but in the canonical view volume, I'm going to have this, this square side that's going to be showing the image that I'm I'm seeing, but I'm also keeping I'm also keeping the z values here. I'm also keeping this this uh, volume nature or 3D nature of the data, so that I can use it for for other operations. So I'm not going to actually collapse it into a 2D image. I'm just going to look at this side of the v volume, right? Uh, and you know it doesn't really make any any difference in terms of computation. So I'm just going to look at the x and y coordinates. And I'm going to use the z coordinate whenever I need it, if I need it. 
in the canonical view volume. All good? Now, there are different ways of doing this uh, projection transformation. Uh, the simplest one is going to be orthographic projection. Uh, in the orthographic projection, I have this camera view space that is shaped like a box. And I'm going to take that box and I'm going to scale it and, and translate it and convert it into canonical view volume. Right. So in this um, camera space, let me go through this again. Our limits were defined as you know, I, I, in X, I have left and right uh, values defined. And in and, and Y, I have uh, bottom and top. And in Z, I have near and far. Um, wow. All right. I think I messed up this label. This label is supposed to be over here. Yeah. Left and right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So in the canonical view volume, I'm going to have convert these to uh, minus one and one. So, um, I just need a, some transformation matrix that will do this for me, right? So let's say that it's going to be something like this. I have my X, Y, and Z values, and I'm going to get the transformed X, Y, and Z values in the canonical view volume. So this is uh, my camera space X, Y, and Z values for any vector, uh, for any vector. And this is going to be my, um, my, uh, canonical view volume space, X, Y, and Z values. Um, so, you know, we have quite a bit of question marks here. Let's, let's try to fill them up. Uh, so the, the last coordinate, we know that we're using it for, for cheating. We don't really need it. So I'm not going to modify the, the, the fourth coordinate. So the last row is going to be just 0, 0, 0, 1, right? So it's not doing anything. I don't really need it. I'm just keeping it around so I can apply and easily apply translations. Uh, so going from a camera space to the canonical view space, what you might you must have noticed is that the directions of X, Y, X, Y, and Z directions are aligned, right? They're not different directions. Uh, so there is no rotation from camera space to the canonical view space. Uh, because there's no rotation, my matrix here, just the, the three by three component here is not going to contain any, any rotational component. So this three by three component is just going to represent some amount of non-uniform scale. And if this is a non-uniform scale matrix, it has to be a diagonal matrix, right? So a diagonal matrix will have zeros everywhere except for the you know, diagonal values. Uh, so I'm going to have some scale applied and some translation applied. So I'm going to move the center from the center of my camera to the, the origin of the canonical view volume. So there's going to be some translation um, uh, and, and there's going to be, well, the translation is probably going to be along the, along the Z direction, but it doesn't have to be. So you can define it in a more general way. Um, so there's going to be some translation and there's going to be some scale because I don't, I would like my left and right values to be scaled to uh, minus one and one. So, uh, all right, this is, this is enough <laughs> uh, talking about this. So here, here's what this, this uh, matrix will look like. Uh, this is not the cleanest form of writing this matrix, but I, I find this a, a little more intuitive to look at. So as you can see, uh, so let, let's let's see what this this matrix does. Let's take a look at one row at a time. So let's take a look at the x row. So the x value is going to be multiplied by two times this r minus l. What is r minus l? My right value and left value. So that means the width of my camera space uh, view volume. So I'm going to divide it by this. So that kind of makes sense because I'm trying to normalize it, right? Uh, and I'm multiplying it by two because my canonical view volume will have edge size of two units. Right? It's not going to be just one unit. So I'm dividing by the width of my 
view volume and multiplying it by the, the desired view volume size, uh, view of um, this desired canonical view of uh, volume size in x direction. Right. So you'll, you'll see that the, the scale factors are exactly um, you know, similar in, in all directions. For y, it's going to be from the bottom to the top. For z, it's going to be near to far. Uh, and they're all multiplied by two because that's that's what we want. And of course, we're going to have to shift the the coordinate frame center to where it's supposed to go. Uh, so uh, if you, if you look at here, uh, what you see is that the x value. So this this all right. Let's take a look at the first row. Uh, this is multiplied by the given x value. So it applies some scale. Y and z coordinates are ignored. And this is just the translation that I apply along the z direction. Sorry, along the x direction. The translation that I apply along the x direction. So this is just to bring everything, bring the center to the center of the canonical e volume. Right? Uh, and if you, uh, uh, so you, you should be able to see if, you, if your x value is uh, left then you're going to get 2 times left uh, divided by r minus l over here like it's going to be minus 2 times left divided by r minus l so these two terms are going to cancel out each other and i'm going to get minus 1 all right uh, so if i if my x value is right then i'm going to have a 2 times right here minus 2 times left so when you add these two together, I'm going to get two. Two minus one is going to give me one. So it's it's going to be linearly scaling between minus one to one. Right. That's why I like writing them in this form because it kind of makes it easier to see. Uh, but when when you look at it, people typically like writing it this way. It's just a more compact form. Uh, it's it's the same equation, um, but looks a little bit more ominous to me. Uh, takes a little bit to, to decode, takes a little bit more to decode this one. So basically I'm doing some very simple scale and translation, and this is how I'm getting my orthographic projection. All good? All right, so here's an example of an image generated using orthographic projection. Um, what does it look like? Do you, do, do you like it? But, Looks okay, right? I mean, it's maybe you like the materials and stuff, but things look a little odd, a little strange if you pay attention. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it does look like isometric projection. That there is absolutely no perspective here, and so like all of these parallel lines are still parallel, and it looks a bit weird. I mean, it kind of looks like an, um, a design document than an image that you would actually expect to see when you look at something. Uh, and because our eyes don't quite work like this, we never see anything like this. We don't see anything with orthographic projection. So this looks rather strange, uh, but it is also very, very useful. Uh, so it's um, the, the, the useful thing here is that, you know, objects are not going to lose their scale. So if I take an object and put it far, far away from the camera, it's going to have the same size. When you look at it from perspective view, things further away, we expect them to look smaller, right? Because that's what happens in, in perspective. Um, so <laughs> yeah, now, OK, if it looks normal to you, don't worry about it. Let me show you what perspective will look like. So if you apply a perspective, this is at the same what the same scene would look like. I mean, obviously, this is not exactly the same camera transformation because uh, perspective projection and orthographic projection are they, they're, they're different enough that it's kind of difficult to use the same camera transformation to get something that looks decent for both. Uh, so if you if you look at this one, uh, you'll see that this is more along the lines of what you would expect to see when you when you look at something. 
And if you compare these two, you'll, you'll see that there's, there's, there's quite a bit of perspective distortion here that kind of makes things look uh, a lot more natural, right? So uh, orthographic projection is very, very useful for all sorts of uh, design related stuff. Um, but, but if you wanna render something in the way that people would expect to see, uh, you probably want to use something more like a perspective projection. All right, so here's the the tricky part. Now things are going to get a little bit more complicated here. So uh, I, I know you've been listening to me for quite a while now, but try to uh, pay a bit more close attention. Things are going to get more and more tricky as as I'm coming closer to my last slide. So. Uh, Raise yourselves. <laughs> okay, perspective projection. So the, the reason why we're seeing things distorted in the perspective way is that because um, our eyes are, you know, kind of small, and our cameras are, are like this as well. We don't have, you know, screen size eyes. It's just looking at the world in, in peril. Uh, we kind of used to seeing things from a, a point's perspective. So you can think of this as like I have my my display here and my camera is behind it. I'm just looking through that display from, from this camera, right? So it's, it's like when I look at the, the scene, the view volume that I'm going to be seeing is going to be expanding like this. So it has this, this, um, this pyramid-like shape um, because of this perspective distortion. Now, this is linear perspective, so th this is what things are going to look like with uh, this kind of a perspective distortion. All right, so I'm gonna to have to figure out a way to account for this strange, rather strange shape and figure out a way to incorporate that into my transformations. All right, uh, so let's take a look at this. Uh, this is the shape that I'm dealing with now. Uh, and so it, my coordinate frame will look like this, right? Again, Z coordinate is moving uh, my camera is uh, looking in, in the minus z direction. Uh, there's x and, and y coordinates, of course, in the line vertical direction, it's in camera space. So that's all the same. And uh, what I would like to get out of this is, is something like this. What I would like to do is I would like to take this sort of strangely deformed shape and convert it into change its shape into something that looks more like this. Because if I do this, if I do this, then I know how to do the, I know how to do viewing. Now, if I can take this space and apply some perspective transformation that gets me into, just deforms that shape into this, then I can do my orthographic projection and see things from, uh, as, as I did before. So, uh, and, and this way I'm going to get the perspective distortion as I wanted, uh, and I'm going to be using the same machinery that I uh, talked about for uh, orthographic projection. So this is the tricky bit. This is not the entirety. Again, I just want to stress this point. This is just to apply this perspective transformation is not perspective projection. This is perspective transformation before orthographic projection. So if you combine perspective transformation and then orthographic projection, we're going to get perspective projection. And that's what we want to do, right? So this is what we want to do. Deform this shape into something that looks more like this guy. Uh, all right, so how am I going to do that? Well, let's try to understand what's going on here. This is actually not something very complicated. Um, this is still sort of like a linear thing. Uh, there, I have lines here in this space. Uh, let's say all of these lines are originating from the from the origin and going through this space like this. All of these lines will be when I when I deform it, when I apply perspective transformation, they're going to turn into these parallel lines. So that's what I'm trying to achieve with this perspective transformation. And if I do this, if I figure out a way to do this perspective transformation, then I can use my orthographic projection to generate my image. All right, well, let's figure out how to do this. So I'm not gonna just give you the, 
the formulation and say, hey, use this, I'm actually going to try to explain how you get it. Um, I don't like memorizing things. I, I don't like asking people to memorize things. It's much better to try to understand how, where things come from, I think. So let's try to do that. So let's um, simplify this view a little bit. Just take a look at one, one slice of it. I'm, so like the x direction is here. I'm sort of looking at the yz plane, right? And I picked just one of those one of those lines that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, originating from the origin, uh, just passing through this volume, uh, starting from the the near z value to the far z value, right? So I have this line segment here. And what's going to happen to this line segment is that when I apply my perspective uh, transformation, it's going to turn into a, a line that is along the z direction, right? Uh, so I, I mean, I could pick any arbitrary position for this, but I said let's align all of these lines with where they intersect with the the near uh, near plane, okay? So I'm going to put all of these lines starting from the near plane, just as a uh, frame of reference. And that's perfectly fine to do, regardless of, even if we did something else, we'll get the same thing, so it doesn't really matter. So uh, it's, it's, they intersect these two line segments, or these two lines, if you think of them as something uh, infinite. They intersect at this point exactly, and one of them is uh, along the z direction, and the other one is going through the origin. Right? So I would like to take this guy and somehow convert it into this guy. Um, and the nice thing about this one is, is that uh, it's, it's, the value of its y-axis remains constant, right? For the entire volume, uh, I'm going to be getting the, the same y-value here. So um, if I think about any arbitrary point here uh, along along this line. Um, let's see the, the important property of this, and this is how we're, you will be able to do this. Any arbitrary point P along this 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 line, uh, of course, it has a, a y coordinate and, and a z coordinate, right? So for all points along the line, this value y divided by uh, py divided by pz is going to be the same. For all of the points, for any point along this line, this is going to be the same. And that kind of makes sense because py divided by pz is going to give me the tangent of this angle, right? So since all of these lines are along the same angular direction, that has to be the same. Right? Does that make sense? So I know that this is going to be the same. So maybe I can use this for uh, transforming this line into the other one. Let's see if we can do that. So um, again, I'm, I'm taking this some some arbitrary point with px and py, uh, and I'm showing you the same slide again. And then I'm going to move to the next slide. <laughs> So, I, I, but, but what I would like to do is I would take this, this line and convert it into, into this one. And when I convert it in this one, let's say my resulting uh, y value is going to be p prime y. All right, just following the same notation that we did. Uh, so how am I going to do that? Well, you know, th this, this quantity is the same, right? So uh, this quantity is going to give me my tangent. If I multiply this quantity with the z value, I should get the y value, right? I mean, if I multiply this with pz, I get py. That kind of makes sense. But the nice thing here is that now that I can tell this value, if I multiply it by n, if I multiply it by n, I'm going to get this value. Basically, I'm going to get this uh, p prime y. So this p prime y is going to be defined as, as this, this, this term, a p y divided by p z multiplied by n. Now, I've been showing you this in the y z plane, 
but if you uh, look at the third dimension, it's exactly the same. It follows the same symmetry. You can write the same equation for the x-axis as well. Uh, so p prime x is going to be um, px divided by pz multiplied by uh, the mu distance. So I can write this in some as a vector equation like this. Right, so this is my 2D uh, x and y coordinates that's going to be coming out of this perspective transformation. Uh, it's, and the x, y coordinates are multiplied by this constant. It's not a constant. Hmm, I'm not liking this. You know, if, if I was multiplying this by a constant, I can do that easily. But I'm multiplying, so I'm taking a vector and I'm sort of dividing its x and y coordinates by its z coordinate. This is tricky. This is tricky because I wanted to represent all this stuff as a matrix multiplication stuff. How am I going to take a take a vector and divide it by its z component using a matrix multiplication? I can't do that. It's actually not possible to do. So uh, I'm going to cheat again to do this. <laughs> the way that I'm going to cheat, you know, I cheated for translation, so I can cheat for this as well. Actually, the way that I'm going to do is that I'm going to extend the concept of homogeneous coordinates just a little bit. So remember, we added this one here, and we said, oh, it doesn't matter. We're just going to be using it. Don't pay attention to it. Now I'm extending this definition. I'm saying um, all points uh, with the z this, this, this fourth coordinate, let's call it alpha, uh, all, of, all points that can be written in this form are equivalent to each other. So this point means exactly the same point if written like this. Uh, so alpha value can be anything. If I just scale all of the x, y, and z components by the same alpha value, I'm going to be representing the same, very same 3D position in the same space. Okay, so this is just a generalization of this, this, this concept uh, of homogeneous coordinates. Actually, this is the, the full definition of homogeneous coordinates now. Um, so this, this, we're going to be making use of this fourth coordinate, so I'm, I'm extending uh, this, this definition like this. Uh, so uh, now the one way to think about this is this way. What I'm interested in in all of these transformations is 3D. I'm trying to manipulate 3D points. What I'm using is a 4D vector. So I'm, I'm in a four-dimensional space, but what I'm trying to represent is a three-dimensional point or three-dimensional position or three-dimensional vector. So what I'm saying here is that in this four-dimensional space, any position along this line in the four-dimensional space by with, with different alpha values. Uh, in this four-dimensional space, all of these will correspond to the same position in the three-dimensional space. That's what I'm trying to say uh, with this definition of homogeneous coordinates. Okay? So um, in graphics, we're going to be making use of this for all sorts of transformations. Uh, and it doesn't matter if I write a position like this or like, or like this, they, they're supposed to mean exactly the same thing. There's really no difference between the two, right? I'm, I'm putting equivalent sign here, but I could put equal as well, uh, and that would be fine. I'm just trying to be a little more careful. Okay, so here's, here's the thing. What I would like to do is this. I would like to get my final positions x and y, they're going to be uh, the near near distance uh, multiplied by x and y coordinates divided by pz. And I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do with the z coordinates, so for the time being, let's call it question mark. In this case, uh, you know, this is one. Um, but to be able to do this division, the way that I'm going to do this is that I'm going to be representing that vector in this form. And this is a lot easier to do. Uh, so I'm going to say the x coordinate and y coordinate are just multiplied by some constant n, n is the near value constant. And this pz, I'm just going to put it in the fourth coordinate, 
that means it's going to be dividing these two coordinates. So right? this is going to be this this vector, this position is equivalent to this one. All right. So that's the general definition of homogeneous coordinates. You know, I warned you before. I told you that we're going to fill with uh, this fourth coordinate later on. This is what I was talking about. All right. So now let's try to do a perspective transformation using this concept. So what I'm going to try to do is to represent this point, I'm actually going to produce this output, right? Uh, so I'm going to figure out a way to do a transformation that's going to generate this. And I can, you know, fairly easily do this, right? So X and Y are just scaled by N and this fourth coordinate is just coming from the Z value. So I can write a, write a matrix multiplication in this form. It's a very, very simple form, right? So scale values, n, n, uniform scale, and this, this fourth coordinate is just the z value, right? Just, uh, you know, 0, 0, 1, 0. I'm just copying the z value from here to the fourth coordinate. Very, very simple. And that's the entirety of perspective projection, except for this guy here, except for I haven't told you what to do with the z co component. Now, now, that's, that part is a little bit tricky. Um, that, that part is a little bit tricky. Let's, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, so over here, um, I don't want to destroy my z-coordinates because then I can use them for, for all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily scale them to some values between 0 and 1. Uh, because I'm going to do orthographic projection after this perspective transformation. So that orthographic projection will handle everything. So what I would like to do, if I can, is that I would like to keep these Z values as they are. I don't want to modify them, right? So, but if I just write here 0, 0, 1, 0, I'm going to get PZ, but it's going to be effectively multiplied by PZ. So effectively, it's going to mean one. Uh, so that, that's, that's not going to work out. So what I would like to get here is PZ. That's what I would like. Um, but if I just write zero, zero, one, zero, this is going to be PZ, but this is going to be PZ as well. So they're going to be, when you divide them together, effectively, the uh, third coordinate, the Z coordinate, is going to be effectively 1. So that's not going to help me so much. Uh, so what do I do? Um, here's what I do. I am going to modify, I'm going to have to do something else. What I would like to, what I actually want is something like, I would like to get PZ squared here. And, and this, this guy is going to be PZ. So if this PZ squared and if this is PZ, you know, you just you know, divide by PZ and you get the, what, you, what you want. So your Z coordinate is not modified at all. But I can't do that. And trying to get that is going to require even more trickery than I would like to do. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to modify the Z value, but I'm going to try to minimize that modification as much as I can. All right. So what I would like to do now, in this case, I'm just going to give you the, res the, the results. Uh, so here's what I'm going to be using uh, near and far values, near and far values. Um, so near plus far and minus near uh, far times near. So um, the reason why I'm doing this is, is this. And now pay attention to this guy. If my Z value is at the nearest position, if, it's, if my z value is n, what I'm going to get out of this is this, this matrix multiplication basically represents this formula, right? The output z value is going to be this. Now, simplify this just a, just a little bit, apply this division by pz over here. I get this. Well, I know that pz is n, right? Because, you know, that's what I said. If pz is n, this n so are going to cancel out each other. So I'm going to get this guy, and, and then from here, I get n. Ha, huh, okay, this is good. So if I start with n, I am getting n, which is good, because I really didn't want to modify my z values. 
Um, what happens if I put um, if if I look at the far plane? If P, my PZ value is at, at the far plane, then this this equation is going to simplify down to this, and I'm going to get the, the far value. So what this is doing is that it's scaling. It's sort of deforming the uh, z coordinate, but keeping the extent of the z coordinate as it was before. So I'm not trying to suggest here that the z coordinate is unmodified. I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that I'm actually getting this pz here. I'm not. All right? I'm not getting this pz. I'm modifying it, but I am modifying it in a way such that the extent of pz values are, it's still going to be the same extent, right? But they're going to be sort of um, non-uniformly scaled a, a little bit. Uh, and that, that's really all about it. So this is going to be my perspective transformation uh, matrix. And the really tricky bit is, is this trick. And this trick is not actually too crucial in my view, uh, because at the end of this, we're going to take this perspective transformation and we're going to apply an orthographic uh, projection after that. Uh, so it's maybe it's okay to have a slightly different value. So this here's what I'm what I'm trying to say. Let me actually show you the full thing. Um, I'm going to start with perspective transformation, uh, uh, and I'm going to apply this perspective transformation matrix, and I'm going to get this uh, this um, view space. And then I can apply my orthographic projection, and that will the whole thing is going to be my perspective projection. But I think this notation is a little um, misleading, just a little bit, because of the way that things are ordered. So let me swap things around <laughs> and show it from this direction. Now we're first applying this, right? First perspective transformation. So that matrix has to be on the right side. First perspective transformation. And then I'm applying orthographic projection. Um, and when you multiply these two matrices together, this is how you're going to get your uh, final perspective projection matrix. All right. So once again, if you if we compare orthographic projection and perspective projection, the only difference here is that I have a perspective transformation step in the middle, well, before I apply uh, orthographic projection. And by now I apply this perspective projection, I'm getting the, the uh, sort of nice perspective distortion that I want. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I believe I've uh, covered everything that I wanted to regarding uh, transformations. Uh, I, I hope that you know you uh, you understood uh, sort of why all this stuff is very very important and very fundamental to all sorts of graphics operations. Now we're not going to be using these three D transformations or viewing transformations in the next project uh, because I would like you to experiment with transformations in two D first. Uh, but in the upcoming projects, when we switch to doing things in three D, we are going to be using these transformations. So it's sort of important that you uh, understand all these concepts uh, pretty well. Thank you for joining, and I especially thank those of you who are sh showing me your, your, your videos. It's really great to see you all. Uh, and I'll um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.